Welcome to the Adam Clark Neuro Oncology Nursing Lecture. My name is Margareta Page. I am a long, long time uh, neuro oncology nurse, and I'll be your hostess uh, this evening. Um, I always like to begin uh, this lecture just um, telling everybody a little bit about the story about why we're here um, and just tell you a little bit about Adam. Um, for if it wasn't for Adam, his wife, and his family, um, we wouldn't be here tonight for this lovely celebration. So in 2004, Adam Clark was diagnosed with brain cancer. He was 25 years old. And in spite of that serious diagnosis at a very young age, he chose to face the challenge by staying positive. He wanted to move forward, and he made sure that he enjoyed each day he also committed to continuing to grow and develop and set new goals for himself. And one of those uh, was to become a registered nurse. So 10 years later, 10 years after his diagnosis, Adam uh, graduated from the Samuel Merritt uh, School of Nursing. He was cum laude, and he started his career um, as a school nurse, and then he moved um, down to Fresno, where he worked at the community hospital as a cardiac nurse. And then, then his next job was to be in Santa Cruz. He had what he described as his dream job at Dominican Hospital. And unfortunately, his tumor required some more surgery at that time. And sadly, about six months later, he passed away. Um, but one of the things that Adam knew, he wanted to set up um, a way to give back to professional caregivers. Um, so that we could continue to uh, grow in our knowledge about neuro-oncology nursing. Um, and so he and his family got together and started this fund so that the neuro-oncology service here at UCSF could offer a lecture in his name uh, for nurses and allied health professionals. And what's become of this lecture, I think it's really wonderful, is it has become an opportunity for people to come together from all the different disciplines around UCSF um, to learn about neuro-oncology, some, some new facts about neuro-oncology, and, um, and celebrate uh, our career. Get together. There's some of you we haven't seen each other in several years. So just get together and celebrate uh, the great work that we do. And so that's um, why we're here tonight. So um, in addition uh, to the lecture and the dinner, um, there's an award. That award is uh, for a nurse um, who exemplifies outstanding leadership, dedication, commitment, and service to the neuro-oncology patient population and the field of neuro-oncology nursing, okay? Now, in kind of a fun tradition uh, that we started the last time we were all together, um, we started passing along this bronze ribbon statue um, <laughs> just as a symbol of, of the Adam Clark Neuro-Oncology Nursing Award. And this actually came uh, from Sharon Lamb, who was, she received the first award. She truly is a pioneer uh, in neurosurgical nursing, and she won that award back in 1978 for her contributions to the field. Um, so the last time we were together, she presented it to our second awardee, who's here tonight, and I'm gonna ask her to come up so that she can pass the ribbon along. Uh, that's Jane Rabbit, who uh, is truly a pioneer in neuro-oncology nursing. So tonight we are, are, are recognizing um, a young and up-and-coming neuro-oncology nurse. Uh, this particular nurse started, like so many of us, um, on a neurologic floor. Um, back in 2012, she came to UCSF. She started as a clinical research nurse, um, where she developed and, and, and blossomed from a neuro nurse to a neuro oncology nurse. Um, she went back to get her master's degree. She became a nurse practitioner. And if she'd had her way, she would have been uh, a neuro oncology nurse practitioner. But at that time, there were no jobs for her. Um, so lucky for us, she went over to, to the neurosurgery department, which was right across the hall. And she worked over there for a couple years and really honed her skills as a nurse practitioner. Um, lo and behold, um, in 2023, the neuro-oncology department began to hire nurse practitioners as part of our care provider team. 
And who do you think was one of our first recruits? Uh, <laughs> our award, this awardee. Um, so this young lady um, is a warm, kind, generous nurse. Um, I think she might be the fastest runner in our department. <laughs> she has a great sense of humor, uh, a wonderful laugh. She's generous with her patients and with her peers. Um, and if I had to say anything about her, I think one of the other things that I really, uh, not just me, I think others would say this too, um, she's a team player. And she is um, a great example of what it means to be a neuro-oncology nurse. And so without further ado, I'm going to announce our awardee. It's Charlotte Huey, uh, nurse practitioner. So I'd like Jane and Charlotte. Jane and Margareta said, uh, I joined the department in 2012, and um, I didn't really know. I, I had been working on the floor in New York in the neuro ICU. I didn't really know I, I, about research. Nursing people told me, don't do it. You'll lose your skills. And, and um, so I didn't really know. I, I moved to across country, and I started in this department, and I was just blown away um, by the department immediately felt like a family. Um, you just are, everyone gets really close because of the patient population, and um, you get very close to your patients. Um, you, you, you learn to know them and know their families, and um, you're with them on this journey, which is very painful, um, but you, it's incredibly rewarding, and um, it was like, uh, it, it was just meant to be, and um, I realized that's why I left advertising, and that's why I went into nursing. That's that's the nursing that I wanted to do. Um, and like Margareta said, I, I took a little hiatus. I went over to nurse surgery, but now I'm back, and I'm very happy, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the program. Um, so tonight we're going to have a series of four short talks. Um, and they're going to highlight uh, some of the unique things that are happening here at UCSF. Charlotte's actually going to tell us about one of the most exciting new treatments uh, that's come along for brain tumors in a long time. So we want you to all hear about that. And then we'll hear from Dr. Chris Weyer Jamora. Um, who uh, will share um, some of her work uh, in the neurocognitive clinic. 
um, about helping people get back to work, uh, particularly brain tumor patients after surgery sometimes struggle. Um, and she'll tell us a little bit about her work and how we help people do that here at UCSF. Um, then we'll hear from Naomi Hoffer, um, who is the manager, the program manager of the Sherry Sobrato Survivorship Program here at UCSF. She's got a great story about how our young adults, our patients who are young adults, are supporting each other. And then we'll wrap it up tonight uh, hearing from Dr. Abby Marks, who is a clinical psychologist and the widow of a former glioblastoma patient uh, that we took care of here. And she started uh, the Milton Marks Family Camp, which is a novel intervention uh, for families with a parent with a brain tumor. And she's gonna tell us a little bit about that. And um, some of you out there have volunteered there. And maybe after you hear about it tonight, you'll wanna volunteer there too. It's a great, wonderful opportunity uh, to be with our patients and family. So we're gonna run through four talks. Um, I'm not gonna, we will hold questions till the very end if that's okay. Then we'll have evaluations and we'll go home, okay? Um, I do have one little thing that the Department of Nursing asks us to think about when we host an educational event now here at UCSF. And that is just to recognize that each one of us um, comes to our work and into our roles from different places. We're all bringing a different uh, perspective. Um, and I think that makes our, it interesting. Um, and we have to be aware that because we're all coming from different places, we have biases. And those biases may impact our ability to provide care. So we just ask as you listen tonight to everything that, has, that we're talking about, maybe just take a moment to reflect on who you are um, and some of those biases and just acknowledge them. Because I think as we recognize those, that will allow us um, perhaps to take better care of our patients and families and improve their health outcomes. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Charlotte Huey. Thank you. Um, so I know I only have a, a, a few minutes, but um, I did wanna take just a short time to talk about Adam. Um, because, uh, like we mentioned, I started in 2012, and so I had the uh, pleasure of knowing and caring for Adam Clar as he went through his journey. Um, it's hard for me not to call him Clar Bar because yeah. <laughs> Lisa, Courtney, and I—that's what we called him. <laughs> In um, that was his email address, and so we. Um, we called him that in the in the nurses room. Not that not that we ever email patients. We only use the the uh, approved um, my chart <laughs> message. Um, but we did. Um, I actually went back last night and I read some of his emails. Um, mostly we were emailing him to remind him to do labs. Um, but he would always write back and dear Lisa, Courtney, and Charlotte. It was so funny. He always like and then he always says something nice about us. You guys are so thorough. You guys are so kind. You guys are, and and he was always funny. Like I was laughing at his so so that's one thing that I want to say about him. He's very funny. He was very kind. He was um, always just so positive. He never complained. Um, he always showed up with that smile on his face. Um, and um, and it was really truly he was a runner um, and uh, it was an honor to care for him. And it really truly is honor to be up here um, fulfilling his wish to have a lecture for nurses tonight. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, so that being said, I, I'm bringing you an exciting uh, talk tonight uh, about the most exciting uh, development in glioma research to date uh, in, in a long time. Um, and so I'm gonna be presenting about IDH inhibitors uh, for low-grade gliomas. So our agenda, to, agenda tonight, I'm going to be going over uh, what exactly is a gene mutation. I'll uh, go over low-grade gliomas and their classifications. Um, I will cover what is isocitrate dehydrogenase, um, take you through the indigo trial that happened at UCSF and what that means for IDH inhibitors and treatment of low-grade gliomas today. So what is a gene mutation? A gene mutation is a change to your DNA sequence that happens during cell division when your cells make copies of themselves. 
there's two types of mutations. One is inherited or germline uh, that originate in the cell or the egg, when, and those are uh, inherited mutations that you're born with. They don't lead to cancer, but they predispose you to cancer. Uh, one example would be BRCA gene. And then there's acquired mutations that occur during your lifetime because of a stressor, such as uh, UV light or cigarette smoke, or they can occur for unknown reasons as well. One single acquired mutation doesn't usually lead to cancer, although sometimes it can. Sometimes it can just be one mutation. Usually it's multiple mutations that eventually lead to cancer, which is why your risk of cancer increases as your age goes up. So genes mutations can happen in three different ways. Uh, they involve the alteration of a DNA nucleotide. This can happen as a result of one of the following, either a substitution of one nucleotide, the insertion of one or more nucleotides into a DNA sequence, or the deletion of one nucleotide. And this drawing, I thought, showed it pretty well. Low-grade gliomas are common malignant primary brain tumors in adults. They're categorized by histologic and molecular characteristics, specifically the IDH mutation. There's two types, astrotypes, astrocytomas, which are defined by IDH and ATR, ATRX mutations. Oligodendrogliomas are defined by AD, IDH and 1P19 co, co deletions. The median age is pretty low, it's 36 to 46, 45 years. Uh, Low-grade gliomas are slightly more common in males, and the median survival for now is 5 to 15 years. So low-grade gliomas used to be defined under the microscope. Then it became clear that something else was going on because the, varied, the outcomes varied so much. In 2016, the definition was redefined based on the cancer genome study. IDH mutation was identified, although those who listened to Dr. DeGroote's lecture yesterday, it sounds like it was identified even uh, in 2009. So, but IDH was both a strong prognostic factor, how patients were going to be doing, and a target for novel drug therapies. In 2021, the definition of logic glioma was redefined based on both histology and genetic profiling. This chart shows the 2021 classification of gliomas. At the top, you will see the importance of IDH. On the left, you'll see that if a glioma is IDH wild type, it's automatically a glioma now. If it, the glioma is IDH mutated, then you look at ATRX and 1P19Q status, uh, like we discussed above, it will become astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma. So the big development, as we've discussed, is isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme. IDH is an enzyme. And when the enzyme is mutated, it produces 2 hydroxyglutarate. I promise I, I practiced that. Uh, which is an oncometabolite that causes cancer cells to grow. So it causes the 2-HG, and then the cancer cells grow. So the current standard of care before the indigo trial is first and foremost gross total resection or uh, the, big, the, the biggest resection that you can have. And then based on the pathology, the neuro-oncologist will decide to do observation only, chemotherapy, or radiation for high-risk gliomas. So the Indigo trial was a, uh, a, a multi-centered trial that happened at UCSF. It was a double-blinded phase two trial the target was residual or recurrent grade two IDH mutant glioma patients. They were randomly assigned to voracidinib 40 milligrams daily or a placebo. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. The secondary endpoint was time to next intervention. The study found that in conclusion, voracidinib, voracidinib significantly improved the progression-free survival and delayed the time to the next intervention. This chart shows the results. In red is the voracidinib group, and in blue is the placebo group. It might be a little too small, but you can see that the uh, progression-free survival, that the time to progression was 27 months in the voracidinib group and 11 months in the placebo group. So it was clear, um, 
progression-free survival benefit. So in conclusion, IDH inhibitors are the first targeted agents to improve outcomes in low-grade gliomas. They inhibit the enzymes IDH, thus reducing the concentration of 2-HG. They cross the blood-brain barrier, forosidinib, more so than ivosidinib. They delay the time that patients need to do radiation or chemotherapy, thus reducing the long-term side effects, which is good seeing as the median age is so low. And overall, they have a low side effect profile. There's two drugs that we're working with, vorosidinib and ivosidinib. The PO dosing is 40 milligrams for vorosidinib and 500 milligrams for ivosidinib. And overall, they're well tolerated. The side effects that we've seen are increased LFTs, headaches, diarrhea, nausea, dizziness, constipation, and increased QT prolongations, which is why we have to do EKGs. So what does the future hold? FDA approval is planned for later this year, hopefully by the summertime. Well, hi folks, it's so nice to see you today. My name's Chris Wired Jamora. I um, I'm the division director of the newly formed neuropsychology and behavioral sciences division. But before all of that, I was a nurse and worked as a bedside nurse for a long time. Um, abandoned my husband, who's also a nurse, and went back to school and decided to learn more about behavior. And now I feel like I've come home a little bit because it's really nice to be. Is that is that better, Suzanne? Well, just speak into the mic. Okay. All right. Yeah. I I I, I move around and I squirm when I talk. So I try not to do that. I try to just stand still <laughs> so that way you can hear me. So thank you, Suzanne, for that. So I wanted to share a story today about a patient that, um, that a lot of us saw together, and she was a nurse, and she was a nurse that really wanted to go back to work. And you'll see from her scans, that was kind of a scary proposition whenever you talk to her family and you talk to her and you talk to what she did, and, and it, we weren't really sure that it was going to work out, and so this is a this is one of the things that we do in in, um, in NCC is to help people, especially whenever they have specific questions about returning to work. And so I thought I'd share her journey with you today, because you know, as as a as also a nurse, it was it was quite heartwarming working with her, and it was also um, it was also there was points that were challenging. I felt like I learned a lot from from working with her. So just a little bit about the neurocognitive service. So thanks to, um, thanks to Suzanne and Margareta's advocacy, we, um, we started this project back, gosh, in 2018. And we, we've really kind of, um, in many ways, learned a lot along the way about how to support patients in managing some of the cognitive and emotional symptoms that they have. It just started with little me, half-time FTE, and now we have a whole service of folks that provide psychotherapy as well as cog rehab and cognitive assessment, and also disability advocacy for, for our patients when they no longer can work. So um, just a little bit of background for those that aren't really familiar with this space. We know that cognition matters to our patients, and despite living longer, our patients are commonly troubled by thinking changes which have been linked to poor survival, relationship issues, and diminished quality of life, including at work. So more than highlighting impairments, COG Rehab is really designed to help highlight what their strengths are, what we can do to help them manage and cope with the cognitive symptoms that they're experiencing in the ways that are important to them, including our patient here, uh, Mary, who's a nurse. Although little is known about the role that, um, that, that this has mechanistically improving um, the kind of the, the pathways, the neural pathways, we know that neuroplasticity is the way that we learn how to speak, that we learn how to change, um, change our lives in many ways neurodevelopmentally, and we're hoping to harness that in, in the course of this work. So what's it like for one of ours to return to work as a nurse that has recurrent brain tumor? So this is the story of Mary. So Mary's diagnosed with a left frontal grade two oligodendroglioma all the way back in 2006. And as you saw, you can see here, I saw her in 2018. And at the time, she was working in a full, as a full-time come-and-go surgical nurse, recently had given birth to her first child. 
after grow and she had a seizure and she ended up um, she ended up in the ER and was diagnosed with with a brain tumor. After gross total resection, she was able to do rehab, go back to work full time. She later had another progression, resected, had chemo, returned back to work. And then in her third progression, she was she had after surgery, she was like, oh, this is different. I'm 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 not bouncing back like I was before. She and her family noticed that she was mixing up steps when she was cooking. This is before she returned back to work. And then get, she had gaps in judgment, so she would walk into traffic hazards. She had difficulty answering multi-part questions. All of that was very atypical for her. She had a master's degree in nursing. She was very, very bright. These were not things that were typical for her. So physically, she was doing okay. She had some motor slowing in one of her hands, but really, it was cognitively that she was struggling. And this was really hard for her because she had the, she had the experience of you have a progression, you have surgery, you go back to work. You have a progression, you have surgery, you go back to work. So this was a whole nother, a whole nother, a whole nother ball of wax for her and her family. So they had a lot of questions. So, and you know, just so you know what her day was like, so typically, her typical day at work was making, ID, making IV kits, reviewing patient charts for completeness, ensuring cl uh, correct pr uh, procedure location. So she'd have to kind of verify that, yes, this is the procedure uh, location that they should do the surgery on, um, and then make sure the team knows that. She would do patient um, head-to-toe assessments. She would give meds, start IVs received you know verbal assignments from the charge nurse you'd have to take all that information in very quickly and have to make clinical judgments based on that and as you can see that was a scan that we received when when she first presented so if you look at that as if i would just look at that structurally i'd be like no way no no so there's there's this bias i think towards futility that when we see certain things or we dig into the details, that I, I think that that's the kind of implicit bias that I think you're speaking to a little bit, that we kind of have to push ourselves a little bit about does form equal function? Does that mean we shouldn't try? Should we do something? What do we do? Well, I like data. So <laughs> this is what I did. <laughs> so, um, so this is our neuropsych testing. And so you, you can see, so the red line is where if you, you want to be above the red line here. So if you were above the red line, that means you were kind of in the average range or better. So you can see here, she had a lot of difficulties in terms of doing tasks in sequence. She forgot steps while she was doing them during the testing, which was what we heard from her family. And this was particularly, and it was worse when she had to do things quickly and when she had to go between two things. So anybody that's worked as a nurse knows that you've got a million things going on. You don't just have two things going on, you have multiple things going on. Um, and that it's particularly problematic because she would be required to do things in a sequence. There was high consequence if she got it wrong and that we, we needed to be able to be realistic in terms of the demands that she was going to be able to be faced. And she also said had some clumsiness in her right dominant hand which was hard because she was going to have to start IVs, right? So that was another kind of piece to this table. Now, her judgment for hypothetical safety situations was excellent. So she had really good fund of knowledge. But if she tried to implement those intentions because she couldn't multitask, that's when it kind of fell apart. So she, she, would, she would look good on, like, just brief conversation. But whenever you kind of dig, dug into the details a little bit, you know, she, she even said, yeah, I, don't, I just don't, I don't feel safe to, to go back and, and work, work as a nurse and to, help, and to help my patients. So two months, every week, she would come in. I think we became good friends by the end of it. So what we started with is trying to help understand, well, what were her strengths? What was she good at? What, what was her job? How could we break apart the actual job and take out the elements that would require her to multitask? Did she have to actually go back to her job as it was? Could we do some workplace accommodations so that way she could be precepted again on things that she could do in rote ways and not necessarily be put into back into like a bedside nursing position. So that's kind of what we ended up doing. So we did lots of, um, we did lots of simulated practice. She had this structured nursing assessment. I remember she and I would sit down 
with her paperwork that she would bring from her hospital. And we would do this structured nursing assessment. And I would be her patient, and she, we would go through it over and over and over and over again. And then slowly but surely, I faded away with the structure and the guidance that I was providing. And that she essentially started off as it being all she could do was the checklist. That's all she could do. She would just do the nursing assessment and the checklist, and then finally it got to a point where she could do that without any errors. And then we'd slowly but surely kind of add new things on. And so, um, and there was also lots of memory strategies we would teach her too, how to remember things and how to organize herself, how to not get into situations where she had to multitask. And could her work accommodate her so that way those aspects were taken out so she could still do what we started with was her calling patients ahead of the surgery, um, the surgery date, and that she would do the pre-surgical checklist. And that's really what she ended up being able to go back to performing is that pre-surgical checklist as someone else was sitting next to her, precepting her and watching to make sure that she was doing it accurately. So um, she did return back after two, um, two days a week, and she was re-precepted. And she just kept to these pre-surgical televisits and then using the standardized tool that we practiced. And, we gave, and she also got workplace accommodations where she ended up doing it in a quiet room and that she had frequent breaks with shortened days so that way whenever, because she did have a lot of fatigue, so to be able to, to manage that. And the other thing that I think that we really had to work on is because she had always been able to be so capable and do things would not really have a lot of difficulties returning back to work she had a lot of anxiety about returning back to work and getting things wrong and um, <coughs> you know not not contributing to her family because she was a breadwinner so a lot of what we talked about was how she could sometimes it was when we have anxiety we need to kind of either problem solve it and if we can't problem solve it we need to cope and so those are the two pedals that sometimes she would talk about she rode a bike and so she would talk about okay so maybe I need to do the problem solving so I need to work on managing my time I need to establish good boundaries I need to kind of have a checklist but otherwise I also have this feeling of feeling unsettled. Well, I'm, I love exercise. She loved Zumba. So she would like, okay, I need to do Zumba every week because that's really, you know, that keeps me sane. She would also kind of do a lot of um, stimulation management where she wouldn't, she would get into a place where she would need a brain break and she would just do lower stimulation because it would, she would kind of get overstimulated, which led to more anxiety. So those were, that was her, um, that was her, uh, that was her bicycle that she said that she would ride on to help manage her anxiety. So I guess my question was, did it actually like change her cognition, or was it just the tool teaching her over and over again? Well, the testing would say that actually her cognition improved by teaching her strategies to improve her executive functioning and improve her attention and concentration and her verbal learning. There, was, there were some specific strategies we taught her that those things did improve above and beyond practice effects. And, um, and I think it showed that she actually was improved um, even after she, she started with that, that standardized tool. But then she went and you know, she was able to go, eventually she was able to go back to her usual work, work as a come and go nurse and, and be, work at the bedside. So that requires better cognition. And so she was able to eventually get there. So that, that to me says that, yeah, we probably did, we did maybe do something um, to help her. So what did this tell me? I, I think it told me that it requires a multidisciplinary effort, that um, the patient's prior experience of returning to work after progression colors their expectations into the future, and that we need a lot of different people at the table. And that's one of the things I like about our um, neuro-oncology interdisciplinary team meeting um, on Thursday is, is that we can all get in the room and we all kind of see a different aspect to the patient, and, and we can all try to kind of work together to problem solve some of the issues that that come up. Um, and of course, the, all these other things are really helpful to getting a good medical workup, having um, the accommodations and work st simulations to make sure that we're actually doing the thing that we're supposed to be doing, as well as making sure that we're engaging the caregiver and, and making sure they get really good mental health resources too. So that's what I learned from Mary. Thanks so
so much, Chris. I'm gonna, there we go. Um, and thank you, Margareta, for putting together this wonderful event and for all of you for being here. I'm just, I want to say that I, I really, um, I, I admire you in wanting to learn about this incredible population because I've, I've gained so much personally in my life by knowing our patients. So I have the privilege um, of working as a program manager for the Sherry Sobrato Brain Cancer Survivorship Program under the wonderful direction of Dr. Suzanne Chang and with the incredible support of Mary Destry, who is also here today. And we've developed a number of supportive care programs for our brain tumor patients. And today I'd like to tell you about uh, one specifically which uniquely serves the needs of the young adult brain tumor population. So our overall mission in the Sherry Sobrato Brain Cancer Survivorship Program is to enhance the wellness and quality of life of patients with brain tumors through a collaborative, multidimensional approach focusing on emotional, physical, and cognitive health. And what we really hope to do is not only support our survivors through symptom management and excellent medical care, um, but also to really help them build their le best lives possible. And we're calling those thrivers. We're going beyond survivorship into thrivership. And so we've built our program on uh, keeping these two guiding questions in our mind throughout. What does it mean to live a great life with brain cancer? And how can we support our patients in doing so? So as Margareta was talking about earlier, the biases, we really tried not to have the bias that it's not possible to live a great life with brain cancer. We're, we were, aim, we're aiming high and saying that it is. So I'd like you to think for a moment about what it might be like for a young adult living with brain cancer. So think about your own life as a young adult, and some of you are young adults right now, so that might not be difficult, but others it might have been a while ago. Um, what was important to you at this time in your life? What were you focused on? So you might have been dating and exploring significant relationships and questioning your identity. Um, you probably were on a pathway to completing your advanced education and starting to move ahead in your career. <coughs> Continuing to uh, assess what it is you want to do with your life. And you might even have started your own family and starting to build your own life outside your, the, the guise of your parents' upbringing and really starting to choose how do you want to live this life. So imagine now what happens when your life is turned upside down because of a brain tumor diagnosis. You have a, a life-limiting diagnosis that's now changing you fundamentally from the inside out. And after treatments and, and never-ending treatments and tests and continual medical care, you're starting to feel like you're getting farther and farther behind your peers. Everyone's moving forward, and it's feeling more difficult for you, like you're in quicksand. And so you might start to feel like some of these dreams that you had are, are getting out of reach and not possible anymore. And you might because people are, aren't really understanding you, you might start to feel really alone in this journey. So as much as we can try to understand what it might be like for a young adult living with brain cancer, we can, all, all we can really do, and hopefully all we can really do, is imagine what it might be like. The AYA community, which is defined in the literature as ages 15 through 39, constitutes only 14.3% of the brain tumor population, and that's really a minority within an already minority patient population. So it is difficult to find peers. Um, and as you may have inferred from that exercise, these patients have to navigate a very serious and negatively impactful disease while in the midst of exploring their identity, their relationships, establishing independence from their parents, pursuing education, developing careers, uh, planning new families, and supporting their families. And some are even starting to support their older aging parents. So they often face unique and unmet psychosocial needs. As a result, the AYA brain cancer patients can experience a deep sense of social isolation, depression, and lack of connection to peers. And there are existing support groups, um, support groups for the AYA community, but they don't necessarily address the needs of brain tumor the, the unique brain tumor needs. And there are existing brain tumor support groups, but don't really address what it might be like to be a young adult 
in that stage of their life dealing with brain cancer. And we do know that peer support is effective in improving psychosocial experiences of people living with cancer. So with this, um, in 2022, and with the strong encouragement of a few of our young adult patient peer volunteers, and after realizing this international void in services, we decided to create our own young adult brain tumor support group. We partnered with a neuro-oncologist from UC San Diego who we had worked with during her residency at UCSF, and we also knew how, what, what an advocate she was for this cause. Um, and we met as a group, and knowing the importance of autonomy in this particular demographic, we soon decided that this was to be a peer-led young adult support group. These patients were already part of the peer support program, so that meant that they had already signed volunteer agreements, they'd already signed confidentiality agreements, and they were already really well trained in supporting their peers. Um, and we developed a multidisciplinary steering committee that consisted of a nurse practitioner, a psychologist, a program manager, um, and neuro-oncologist. And we met monthly to discuss with these peer facilitators um, how to run the, the support group and, and offer them support as they took ownership of this group. So the UCSF staff then, we handled all the promotion, the registration, the screening, the email reminders and logistics. And we made sure that a staff member would always be on call during the, the meeting time of the support group. But the peer facilitators took ownership right from the beginning. Um, they arranged how they wanted to run the group. They arranged uh, the slides that they used, the meeting agreements that they developed. Um, and they also identified a platform for ongoing participant connection, which was Marco Polo and then later Discord. And we launched this, that, we launched, uh, this support group in May of 2022. So here's what the registration data looks like as of October 2023. We have over 100 registrants from around four countries, across four countries, and the medium number of attendees is 15, um, ranging from, the, at the beginning there was just four people attending and now it's up to 24 people attending. And we asked the peer facilitators, how long is it taking you to volunteer for us as a facilitator of this support group? And they said about six hours, six hours a month they spend, including the monthly meetings that we have as a multidisciplinary steering team. And we conducted two satisfaction surveys with our participants. We did one in December 2022 and another one in October 2023. So the first survey addressed the participant preferences for structure, and 90% said that they would like a mixture of topic-led and open discussions. We asked them what topics they would like to discuss with their peers, and we also compared this to what topics they would like discussed with their medical providers. So this was interesting information. As you can see here, that um, there are, were specific differences in preferences with the topics of friendship, romantic relationships, anxiety, and mindfulness, topping the list of what they wanted to talk specifically with their peers about, as opposed to their providers. <coughs> and our later survey, conducted in October 2023, asked about their satisfaction with the group. And here you can see there's a high degree of satisfaction. Um, the third question here asks if they feel that there is value in this being a peer-led group and everyone agreed or strongly agreed. And here are some of the quotes from the respondents. I think it's an invaluable resource for an often overlooked pa patient population. The age of participants always allows discussion relevant to my concerns. It is unbelievably appreciated and makes such a difference for me personally. So in sum, we believe that peer-led groups can be an effective way to provide social support for the young adult population with brain tumors. Uh, Peer-only groups serve a need for certain conversations that they don't wish to have with their providers. But there, it is really important for the group that there be at least two peer facilitators and one or two backups. And due to the nature of brain cancer, we know that health issues, health status can change very quickly and that the lives of our, our patients can easily become <coughs> overwhelming due to physical and cognitive fatigue associated with the disease. So backup facilitators are crucial. Um, and it's also important to have training in 
in peer facilitation. And we were very lucky to have this group here who is just wonderful, innately wonderful in their skills at facilitation. Um, it's also really important that there is support for peer patient facilitators and medical professionals to meet regularly to problem solve, to really offload <coughs> anything that we feel like they're taking on as their own burden, um, and to, to really help give them as, as much emotional support and practical support as possible. Um, so we, we, in sum, conclude that given resources, <laughs> patients can effectively empower themselves to build their social support system. And I want to thank you so much for your time, and also a special thanks to Dr. Schulte, Mary Destry, Suzanne Chang, and Liz Choi, and our incredible peer facilitators. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yesterday, I was watching clips from the Emmys and um, saw that Nick Offerman, when he was accepting an Emmy for his role in The Last of Us, he said at the very end of his speech, what we do to care for each other is the whole damn point. And I know as nurses, you particularly understand the power of caring for each other. It really reminded me of our camp, what we do to care for each other and the healing power of that. So I just really briefly, because I know we've, we've talked about this, um, you know, I've, uh, all of the speakers have talked about this uh, to one extent or another how much brain tumors can impact and change people and the people around, impact the people around them. Um, I imagine I don't need to tell this audience how cancer can impact all members of the family. Surgery, chemo, radiation, uncertainty, fear of, uh, of the patient, the parent in this case dying. And living with a brain tumor adds more to cope with. Um, as you know and as you've heard, their personality changes and cognitive changes in some patients, affect regulation, anger, lack of empathy even sometimes, that can affect um, a patient's ability to parent. Um, both parents can be really stretched thin and less available. And um, research has shown that there are sky high rates of depression and stress in both brain tumor patients and caregivers and kids in families. Um, as Naomi mentioned, with the young adults, there's a tremendous amount of isolation, social isolation. As it's really hard for anyone outside of a family to really understand what the experience is like day to day. And there's also some research that shows a certain disconnect between families and medical providers. Uh, many families don't feel that their doctors and sometimes nurses really understand how brain tumor affects everyday family life. Um, um, as a lot of the visits just focus on cancer. Of course, those studies were not done at UCSF where we have an amazing, amazing programs, but um, there still is a disconnect. And there aren't many f programs for families with children. Um, they're really far, uh, few and far between. So um, as you heard, my husband Milton passed away, uh, died in 2012 of a glioblastoma. This picture was taken right before he was diagnosed. Um, and as you can see, our kids were really little at that time. They were four, four and eight. Um, and after he died, Margareta Page and I started, um, decided to start this camp with the tremendous support of the neuro-oncology department. Um, each year, we serve 10 to 15 UCSF families with a primary malignant brain tumor. So a little bit more just a background about what our camp is. It's an annual three-day camp. Staff is there for four days um, for families with children living at home. Um, all of our families are treated or have been treated in the past at UCSF, and importantly, UCSF neuro-oncology staff um, participate in camp. You'll hear more about that later, but that's just turned out to be key to have families have their medical providers there at camp. Uh, then year-round, we keep in contact with families. We have some year-round activities, although the camp is the main event. Why a camp? Um, we really feel like there's something about camp 
and the immersive environment and the kind of intensity that it can create, even if it's only three days, it feels like a lot longer. Um, and that we could really create a whole environment where families are understood and feel like they belong. We wanted to have a place where people's basic needs were completely taken care of, which would allow them both to get a break from the stress um, and, and use that break to start to be able to connect more with their family members, with other families, and be able to reflect. Having that kind of breather really helps that. Um, and also, when we're taking care of their needs and anticipating their needs, they know that we get what their needs are, um, which can really help people feel completely understood and less alone. We also really wanted to foster connections between families and their medical team, and especially we wanted to give people a place to just have fun. Um, what can camp do? Um, it can really help lessen depressive feelings, feelings of anxiety at stress, at least temporarily, right around that weekend. Uh, can help families can create connections with other families and really most importantly, I think a, a feeling of a camp community that stretches well beyond the time of the camp and, and in throughout the year. Uh, we wanted to really help these very at-risk kids um, with a lot of family disruption. And um, we wanted to help families feel more connected to their medical care in a way to have kind of the whole of UCSF warmed up for them by seeing medical providers there. Um, one mom at camp told us the story of how after their family's first camp year, she had to have another resection of her tumor. And they lived quite a distance away from UCSF. The kids were really scared of her going back into the hospital to be away for so long, not really knowing what was going to happen to her. And then the mom said to her kids, but you know who's going to be taking care of me there? Margareta's going to be there. Dr. Clark's going to be there. Dr. Chang's going to be there. And they named all these people that had been at camp. And then the kids were fine as they're going. <laughs> they knew that the camp people would take good care of their mom, and that they'd have her back. So, and that this was a few years ago. And I have to say, the oldest daughter of that family, who's now in college, came back this year to be a counselor at our camp. It was really moving. She says when she grows up, she wants to be a camp director. Aww. So a little bit about the structure of the camp. We have, it's a multidisciplinary effort. We have amazing um, people in all kinds of disciplines, not just medical uh, and mental health, um, but music, art, improv, an amazing team of um, youth counselors, uh, photographers, a whole logistics team to support it. This, um, of course, is our medical team. You may recognize some people there. Um, before camp starts, I, I just want to show you, a lot of this is going to be like photos of camp, just to give you a taste of it. So we have a whole, this is just staff. We have a whole day before campers get there. Uh, we meet on th starting on Thursday just to set things up and get on the same page and bond as a staff. So we're ready to really kind of help people get in the camp spirit. This is Friday morning in our camp welcome. As you can see, we welcome people. We set the tone with open arms and fun and joy. And we show them right away we're going to take care of them. So as you can see at the top, I don't know, you can see a little bit of the golf cart there. We meet families when their cars arrive. We have the youth counselors reaching out to the new kids who've never been at camp before. We've got, um, we're introducing ourselves to them. We're taking their luggage. We're putting it in the golf cart. We're helping them get settled in their cabin. So right away they see we're going to be taking care of you. And just at the bottom there, you can see returning family. Um, after lunch, we have an interactive introduction activity that lets family meet, meet each other in a fun, engaging way uh, where the kids can feel really, um, really included. Um, we ha kids spend about half of their time at camp in same aged groups with amazing youth counselors. It's about a one to two or one to three ratio where they can have fun with other kids who get it. Um, while kids are having fun and being well cared for. Parents have support groups. This is not a support group. We don't take the photos in the support groups. It's just people hanging out. But um, with, we have a mental health team and a nursing team that, um, that runs the support groups. We also have uh, clinician, licensed clinicians doing couples meetings. 
uh, with each couple if they'd like that. Uh, we have separate support groups for caregivers and patients. Um, and then um, those special groups uh, stay together and do either a team building activity like ropes or they do art or massage. Um, again, we don't have photos of this, but we do have hour long massage sessions on the massage table. We're really taking care of people here. This is just a little snapshot of what meals can be like. You know, um, kids eat quick, especially when they go on to get back to the fun. So we have the youth counselors on hand to just hang out or swoop them away, and the adults can hang out, get to know each other, or just relax. After uh, meals, we sing camp songs that are specifically curated to reflect the experience of these families, and also really fun to sing. This is just a photo of the dads at camp. Um, kids bond with counselors and they bond with each other. And if you think about it, most kids have never known anyone except maybe their siblings who are experiencing what they are. Some teenagers don't want to camp at, come to camp at all at first. Some especially don't want to feel or think or open up. And it's really an amazing thing to see these kids, especially the adolescents, transforming throughout the three days, cracking open just a bit to let themselves be with e each other, lay in a field of grass looking at the stars with their friends, and speak a couple of words about how they're feeling, and then know that they're understood and loved. Just wanted to show you um, more photos of the kids having fun at camp. You can tell this is closer to the end of camp because of just how relaxed everyone is and how much of a group. I mean, you'd think these kids just knew each other for years already. Um, we have, as you may have guessed from the quality of the photos we have shown so far, we have two professional photographers at camp taking family portraits, and they make individual family uh, camp yearbooks for each family, featuring not just these formal photos, but all, which they get on a canvas after camp, and a lot of families have in their living rooms and pride of place in the house. Um, they also get this book where um, it's pictures of the whole camp, um, but also featuring kind of informal photos of their family as well. So family art each year goes along with our yearly camp theme. This year, our camp theme was Tell Your Story. So families decorated the outside of book boxes together to visually represent who their family is. And on the inside, when the book opened up, each family member um, in separate activity times made an art piece, a story that represented the story of their lives and where their brain tumor fits in it. So as I said, there's a lot of time for reflection of kind of where you are as a family and individually at that moment. And these are just some photos of families feeling close together. Fun at the pond. Kids are there. Parents sometimes swim, sometimes hang out. Families together. Of course, because it's camp, we have a campfire and we have s'mores. This is just a photo of the youth counselors and the kids just hanging out, being close at our campfire where they do skits and the ubiquitous camp friendship bracelets. So at the end of camp, um, people, we gather in a circle and everybody tells the story of their camp experience. One by one, the families go around and the story of their art piece and the meaning to them. This is just, and people are singing and kind of this year, we had a, for just, I mean, totally coincidentally, there were a number of girls who loved gymnastics. A lot of the skits were pe kids doing gymnastics, so there they are, taking one last chance to do some, I can't remember what those are called, together, um, playing the instruments. And I, this is Pooja, our camp nurse. Um, there's no real arm injury here. Um, if you can tell by the smile on this little girl's face, it's a kind of, Pooja, can you pretend wrap my arm with real gauze? Um, and I really wanted to include this photo because it shows to me how integrated into the camp the medical team is. A lot, of, a lot of times they're behind the scenes watching patients, making sure everything is safe. Um, but 
and they do the hard work of keeping an eye on everybody, on patients so everybody can relax. But families can see how much the nurses and doctors and social workers are there to be with them, get to know them better, understand what they're going through, and even play with them. Nurses have your back with any hurt, pretend or real, or sometimes both. Um, so our camp, uh, we, our camp outcomes, um, we're able to relieve stress in families, um, help them with feelings of isolation, help them with depression. And we help uh, all of the members of the families, and especially, I think, the at-risk children, feel more understood and less alone. And importantly, uh, importantly, I think, really help families feel connected to their medical team back at UCSF. Um, and we also, there's an impact on the medical team, I feel like, people who, people who attend camp. It's not just people from UCSF, but, um, you know, first, I think, Volunteer medical volunteers feel like they can understand a little bit more about what the day-to-day -day of these family uh, experience of these families is outside of the clinic and in a field where sometimes there isn't a lot you can do to change things medically for patients camp is a way for staff to get that particular satisfaction and joy that comes from doing something where you can see right before your eyes the impact it's having and the joy that it's bringing bringing people joy seeing the way they transform over the course of camp connecting with them and seeing how they connect with others. Camp feels intense, joyful, and healing. What we do when we care for each other can be a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to our four speakers. I think what I was really amazed by and so proud of um, is what's happening here at UCSF beyond the hospital room and beyond the clinic. Charlotte highlighted what's happening um, as we bring our discoveries from the bench to the bedside, which is the most exciting. And then I think these other three speakers highlighted the really amazing, unique, unusual, holistic care uh, that we are providing here at UCSF for our patients. We are we go around. We are one of a kind. Um, and so I, I, I hope, um, it's just by listening them, to them tonight, that you all um, just now know about these services. And, and, and they might be an opportunity, as you take care of your patients going further, just to remember these things and link them to these services or participate in the camp um, or what, whatever it is that you're called to do. So... Um, I would like to invite all of our speakers back up to the front because maybe some of you have some questions and so we have a, 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 we have a lot of time for questions if you have any questions or maybe any discussion about any of the things we heard tonight. Yes, I, maybe I missed it. Where is the camp located? Oh, I forgot to say that. Okay. So um, for the past few years, we've been at Walk, Walker Creek Ranch, which is in West Marin. It's about an hour north of San Francisco. We were also at Camp Newman in um, Santa Rosa for a while. How do you select the uh, families participating in these camps? Actually, we really leave that up to, this is one of the amazing things about our partnership, we really leave, leave that up to the team uh, and then they're in the caregiver program. So I can talk a little bit about that. I think, um, so through the caregiver program, we're keeping an eye on the families that have children. So we sort of know who has kids. Um, mm -hmm and have a running list. Um, and as it gets closer to camp, we send out uh, a notice to our clinicians, to the doctors and the nurses who are also working with the families to say, hey, camp's coming. Do you have anybody that you know that has kids that you think might want to come to camp? And we gather the names. And then we look at who's, we, we have, once our families come, they never, they come back every year. Yeah. So we have a group of sort of returning families, and then we sort of look at um, the kinds of things that go into it, our, our need, if we, if, there, if we can ascertain a need, of course everybody needs it. But we're also trying to balance sex of the patient, age of the kids, and diagnoses. So when they get there, there's, it's not all men or women, um, and that we have a nice balance age range of the kids. What is interesting, I, I find this interesting, um, you would, this camp is free. Um, 
you would think whoever we offered this camp to, they would want to sign up right away and come. Um, but every year, we end up with about 11 or 12 families. We, it, even though we think it might fill, sometimes people have to drop out because of illness or change in their medical condition. But a lot of families are sometimes afraid. They haven't really had these conversations even with their kids. So the thought of coming to a camp to talk about the illness is too scary. And so sometimes people put it off and think, oh, I'll come next year. And sometimes next year is too late. But it is, it, for a lot of families, it, it, it's, it's, it's scary to come. But if they do, every single one of them comes back. Yeah. So. And these are, these are patients who are getting all of their main care at UCSF, not being treated in the community? No, they're just, they just have to come in our door. So wherever they're getting treated, um, once they've had an appointment at UCSF, they would be allowed to come. We have a lot of people, families who live in the Central Valley who come to our camp. So some of their care is at UCSF and some of their care is local. And then we have actually a number of families who've moved out of the Bay Area who fly back from camp. Mm -hmm. from yeah. People from Oregon too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We drive down. Yeah. What is the year? Um, this coming year, it's in September. I think it's the weekend after Labor Day. I should have it ingrained in memory. It's, <laughs> it's September like 12th. 12th. 12th to 15th. 12th to 15th. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. So how's Mary doing? She's still working. Great. <laughs> Full time, too. Which wow. is really amazing. But, um, I, I, and we've gotten this question before, you know, how do you know? I mean, I, I think that some of it is you know through the rehab if they are slowly but surely improving. And not everyone has a treatment response. And so I think that those are some of the hardest conversations that you have to then start talking about income replacement for disability and, and other things, which I think is another unique part of our program is, is that we do help them with that, um, with the social work team and other people, because sometimes that means a world of difference to patients. That they, um, that they can still contribute financially to their family and leave their family in a good place. I think she was kind of mad at me when I said, I don't know if this is possible. But I think we got to be friends. <laughs> Can I ask how many, how many employers are open to working with the teams? I would imagine that that has to be a real conversation. Yeah, I mean, so I invoke the Americans with Disabilities Act, so they all are. Um, <laughs> and if they don't, then they get an employment attorney. So I, I think that it's really helping them know their rights and responsibilities, helping the patient know their rights and responsibilities. And sometimes it's my job to educate the manager what their responsibilities for the patient are. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I'm having those meetings with the patient and their manager and me, which I think initially can be quite challenging um, because it's new for a lot of managers too. They, they've never had this sort of thing. And so and in California, you don't have to disclose the medical condition. So I don't disclose the medical condition um, at, you know, if I don't need to, but I do need to let them know that they have to work with us in terms of the, um, the accommodation, reasonable accommodations. And there's all these kind of guidelines about what that means. But, um, so yeah, I, I think, but it's one of the things that we've talked with um, some providers about is putting into the medical record the patient's doing great or they're doing fine. Those sorts of things can be a little murky whenever we're kind of transitioning to disability and things like that. So just being kind of staying in the lane of um, the disease is stable or staying in the lane of, um, you know, just putting the minimum necessary in the medical record is really mm -hmm. important because sometimes that information is later used for other purposes, you know, um, for the disability process. So just being kind of aware that we want to just try to be mindful that for many patients, it's not if they go on disability, it's when for a lot of patients with glioma. So we want to just be mindful of, of that kind of backward engineering and just putting the necessary in the medical record for that purpose. Good point. 
I had a question. Do you work with employers and educate them on what to expect or you know what they're going to be facing with the returning employee? When Adam was first diagnosed, he was working for the Oakland Athletics mm. in baseball. And um, he his uh, he got tremendous support from the team, from from the back off from the front office. Um, they were all generous and, and, and you know, how are you doing doing cards, you know, hope you can come back. Um, he got signatures from, you know, baseball, you know, uh, baseball players as, as well as uh, some of the radio personalities. Wow. You know? um, and when he was, uh, uh, when he was, uh, uh, when he went to uh, John Muir, you know, for the, for the x-rays and the MRIs that they uh, put him in this room. And at the time, John Muir Medical Center was one of the big uh, contributors or sponsors of the Oakland A's. So they got him a big, big room. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he deserved it. He deserved yeah. it. But it was, uh, you know, when he came back, uh, he had a lot of support. He had a lot of friends there uh, because uh, everybody had these CRT screens back then. His eyes couldn't take that, so he went and got a. Do you remember he got a, a flat screen? He wanted a flat screen because it doesn't flash. Mm -hmm. And um, so. you remember that? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, but he. Um, I, I remember him. Elizabeth, you can probably got you know, the the support he got from his friends, from you know employees and other people, you know. I think it's so important. I really feel like that you don't have to get into an adversarial ADA conversation, right? We could just like let's let's just figure out the best way to support this person who's a huge asset to your company to do the thing that they do best and that you need them to do. I feel like those are the best kind of conversations that I have with managers. And you know, I, I think that some sometimes it goes really well and sometimes you know, it really is like I, I think that's the nice part about having um, objective test data is I I have a way to it's not just my opinion or what I've talked in, but I've been able to kind of have that um, have something grounded in, in some in some data. But I don't think that by and large there's been a lot I think it's a big gap that there's not a lot of employers that have that expertise or that knowledge. Oftentimes UCSF is bringing that to the kind of returning work process by having those meetings with the managers and HR. So I'm oftentimes in meetings with managers and HR and union stewards and all of those people to try to so they help understand them. what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And so trying to help them know that there are things that can absolutely be done here and and we and let's just make it so that way everybody has a fair shot at getting this job done equally or equitably. Um, and it doesn't mean that they, they can't do that just because they have a medical condition. And for some people, it's really important for their identity, yeah. right? They mm -hmm. worked yeah. like Adam or other people or Mary. She, I mean, she was she went to school for so long and had already worked so long as a nurse, and that was not her thing. You know, just who she was, the person. She wasn't willing to give that up. And that I think that if we would have not tried to give her some way to do that. That would have been really, really negatively. It would have negatively impacted her mental health and her quality of life. So, so, and it worked out. Can't say it always does for everybody, <laughs> but um, we were glad to be part of the process. There's so much shame that's sometimes part of the picture with brain tumor survivors, mm -hmm. and just to be able to give them back that part. Yeah. It's a nice kind of diversion. Um, thinking about your illness. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just going to work. <laughs> and that's one of the things we found with the peer support program and the, and the peer connection is that they've said that oftentimes there's a big gap between the norm, the normal neuro norms, they call them, um, where you have to kind of explain to them, you know, like, here's what it's like for me having brain cancer. But when you're with your peer, you're already on this level. Mm -hmm. And so you can just start talking about other things, deeper things, you know, without that understanding. Mm -hmm. And, um, found that it really is helpful to have, have those kinds of connections mm -hmm. and not feel so ashamed. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm gonna, I want to thank you all. I'm going to have Dr. Chang come up. Mm -hmm.
So thank you all so much for, for coming tonight um, to honor Adam and his family for this wonderful tribute to him. Um, I think that uh, I want to especially thank the speakers, wonderful, and especially to Margareta, who has worked really hard to think about what is important for you as nurses, um, especially taking care of our patients in the hospital. You know, you, you tend to see them in this sort of small part of their lives and understanding what it is that we do in our clinic and how we try to help the patients and their families. So I think Margareta spoke about our caregiver program. We have the only caregiver program, I think, in the world that's dedicated to our patients' families. Um, so, so to be able to do that and offer those things is something that you can think about when you see the patients. If you recognize that they might have some issues, please reach out to the team. We have so much going on in our survivorship program. You heard about the cognition, but we have exercise, we have integrative health, we have so many other things. Our social workers are amazing. Our nursing team, as you all know, is amazing. So um, it's part of sort of really integrating everything that we do uh, as Margaret said, this holistic approach to taking care of patients. So uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and especially to thank Adam's family, Liz, his wife, his parents, Liz's mom for coming. And, um, you know, the, the fund is a go, a fund me. Is that what you call it? Go fund me? Um, it's a fund, yeah. <laughs> it's like a, well, it's a fund through UCSF. Yeah, but the families and friends just keep putting us into this fund, which is fantastic. And this will allow us, I think, to have this annual event, you know, for in perpetuity is what I'm hoping. So, and we would love to see you again all next year. So thank you very much. Thank you.